Funding for New Mexico in Focus provided by viewers like you. This week on New Mexico in Focus, how many officers is enough? Albuquerque Mayor Tim Keller says APD will fall short of his staffing goals, but are we using the officers we have correctly? And asking politely to bigots is never going to make social change. The impact of protest 20 years later. This Masters Week, Martha Burke recounts her stand for equality at Augusta National Golf Club and reflects on the progress we still need to make. New Mexico in Focus starts now. Thanks for joining us this week. I'm your host, Gene Grant. In 2003, women's rights activist Martha Burke led a protest against Augusta National for its male-only membership rule, a rallying cry against discrimination on the golf course and in the boardrooms of corporate America that captivated the nation back then. In the second half of our show, New Mexico and Focus's new executive producer, Jeff Proctor, sits down with Martha Burke to look back at that protest and its ripple effects today. Several oil and gas producers are facing polluting fines thanks to the work of journalist Jerry Redfern. Jerry's followed the ins and outs of New Mexico's fossil fuel industry for years now, and in less than 15 minutes, our land's Laura Paskus asks him how his reporting caught the attention of state officials. But first, we turn our attention to Albuquerque, as the mayor has introduced his budget proposal for the next year, one that calls for fewer police officers than he once promised. Let's get to the line. Welcome to our line opinion panelists for the week. We're happy to be joined in person in our Albuquerque studios by attorney Laura Sanchez. It's been a while since she's been here. Good to see you, Laura. Radio host at KKOB 96.3 FM, TJ Child is here, legend here in Albuquerque and a political legend herself. Former state senator Diane Snyder is here as well. Thank you all for being here. Now we start this week with a look at the Albuquerque Police Department and the city's plans for it in the next fiscal year. Albuquerque Mayor Tim Keller introduced his proposed budget for 2024 last week. It included money for 1,000 officers at APD. Keep a pin in that number. Quite a few less than the mayor's original goal of 1,200 officers during the, his campaign. The city has previously budgeted, budgeted the department for 1,100, but according to the Albuquerque Journal, the department has just 856 sworn officers as of last week. TJ, let me start with you here. Why has this been such a traditionally uh, a difficult problem to attract and keep officers here? I want to talk about that 1,200 number in a second, but yeah. the 856, why can't we get more officers here? What's going on? You know, you, you say here, and I don't think it's here. Uh -huh. I think it's everywhere. Uh -huh. uh, I don't think this is an Albuquerque problem. Obviously, we have our problems. Sure, sure. I mean, you, you, we all know, we all talk about crime all the time on my air. We talk about it all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, but, the, but, but, but uh, this is not an Albuquerque problem. If you look at this, this is nationwide. I mean, no one wants to be a cop anymore. Nobody wants to do it. And so is this reflective of uh, just post-COVID stuff where nobody wants to work anymore mm -hmm. in general? Mm -hmm. Or is this have to do with uh, uh, post uh, uh, post George Floyd slash defund the police stuff, uh, yeah. and, and and cops see this stuff and they and they, and they I don't want to be a cop now, right. Right. but you know I, I talk to a lot of law enforcement people on, on my ear. I mean the current, former, probably future, <laughs> but but uh, one of the things they say too, uh, uh, you know we have so few cops on the street right now. Mm -hmm. so, and there, there's so few, there's no time for real policing. There's, you, they cannot do police work because, I mean, you know, like the bike patrols we used to have, oh, yeah. the horse patrols we used to have, things like that, because all they're doing right now is going from emergency to emergency, emergency. They get a 911 call, so it's those calls to this call to this call. So they're putting out fires instead of being able to do real uh, uh, crime preventive stuff and, and community police work. They, they don't have time. It, right now, I was told, it's all it is now is crisis management. And, and why don't, and, you know, I think that, right. that might be your answer why people don't want to do That's this. Right. That's right. It's difficult. Um, Senator, I've got an interesting point here. According to the U.S. Census, Albuquerque, of course, with just over 500,000, in the local, and that's about 1.5 officers for every 1,000 people in Albuquerque. But the open question is, what is the right amount of officers? We've gone from this 1,200 to 1,100, now it's 1,000. Are we judging these things the right way? I don't think that we are. Yeah. And I, I, I'm going to say a lot of things here, and I'm not faulting anybody, mm -hmm. because a lot of what I read on the research of this is 
you know, one Democrat mayor blamed the Republican mayor and vice versa. Right. And, this, right. and I'm so tired of hearing that, that I don't care anymore. Right. Uh, I, I have my own personal beliefs, but that's one thing. That doesn't always mean mm -hmm. that I'm right about the solution to our problem. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that I found in all this is nobody really knows what the right number is. Mm -hmm. The national average is a just over uh, 2%. I see. Or 2.8 is what it is okay. per 1,000 people. Um, and as you said, we're at one point, what, five, something yeah. like that. Yeah. So we're below. But two things occur. Every politician tells us, including our current and our previous, that we're going to, ha I'm going to increase it to 1,000. To what, 1,200, right. we're gonna get this crime under control. Yeah. And then that never happens. They focus so much on trying to find people. In an interesting article that we read, Jeff Proctor's article from mm. 2011, was talking about how we've cut back the requirements. Right. It used to be yep. you were required to have a college degree. That's right. Mm -hmm. Now, pretty much if you're breathing, you, and, and I'm not being tacky, sure, sure. but I just, it, th there are so many different relaxation of the requirements. Mm -hmm. And this is, the quotes that were used were coming from the people doing the training at the police academy, right. Right. that this is happening. That, and we got so, the results, the city from it, that, We've got the results. Quickly, we're yeah. doing, we're doing, trying to do right on one side, mm -hmm. but we're doing so much wrong trying to meet that goal of a thousand people, mm -hmm. I want the politicians to stop telling me. I want them to, that they're gonna do a thousand or 1200. Right. I want them to say, we've got 856 right now. Right. My goal is to have 900 mm -hmm. by the end of my first term, fully qualified, fully trained, put the requirements back in. Yep. And then the other piece is, where are we assigning? Ah the officers that me, we have. Let me uh, turn to Laura yeah. on that very question. That's interesting. By the way, I want to follow up uh, what, what Senator mentioned about the uh, 1.5 here in the city. Uh, you know, New York City's at 4.1, Washington, D.C., 5.3, Detroit, 3.8. So the, for, for perspective, we just don't have a lot of cops on the street. Yeah. And so that goes to the question, uh, Laura, good to see you, as, as I mentioned earlier. Um, are we using these folks the right way? TJ mentioned it's triage earlier. They can only answer you know, heavy duty calls. It's not much community policing. Remember when that was a term here about 10 years ago? Mm -hmm. No one's even talking about no. community policing anymore because you need the numbers. What you, what, it, it's a hard one to pin down though. It is. Yeah. Um, I think you know, it's a little bit of chicken, uh, chicken or egg, right? I mean, right. We, we have a police force that is responding to a lot of um, mm -hmm. crises situations, but we have crisis situations that need to be responded to. Right. So I don't That's know right. that, you know, I mean, we have, they have to respond to those. We have so many homicides occurring. I mean, we're barely in the fourth month of the year and already we have an insane number. Every night you see, you know, yep. another homicide. Seems like so it. of course they're gonna be doing some triage and I think that's an important part of it. As you increase the, the number of qualified, trained people, mm -hmm. hopefully they can start to do more of that community policing model, right. uh, spend more time, you know, getting to know the community, all of that. But I think until we get to those numbers, right. they're, they're going to have to be responding to That's the right. crisis situation. Should we be counting cadets in the new department, the new uh, folks inside the department who were uh, not sworn officers, but they're social workers, and having those folks go out for some calls instead? Should we count those folks in the number of this 856? Is it actually fundamentally bigger than it is? Uh, well, I think it depends how, you know, I mean, 1,000, 1,200, 1,100, it depends what you're talking about. If you're right. talking about actual, you know, qualified police officers that are trained the right way, the way we expect a police right. officer to be able to respond to any situation, crime in general, then, I mean, that's what we're talking about. I'm not sure we're talking about folks who do more social work type. Right. Um, right. Still an important part of the solution. But uh, mm -hmm. we, I think transparency, transparency is important. So if we are counting them, then let's figure out what is their role and what is the number actually supposed to be. I think it's a good move yeah. actually on the administration's part to be realistic with their goals. I think if you are, and it's one thing to kind of during a campaign to come up with a number and focus on that, right? Yeah. But as you're, as you're working through the process and you're, you know, in terms of good government, good administration, and you realize that there are serious challenges to increasing right. the numbers at that level, especially right. if you're going to 
um, dramatically relax the requirements, then scale it back, be transparent about it. Mm -hmm. A thousand goal, a thousand uh, police officers is a good goal sure. to have between now and the end of this administration right. because we are at such a low level, 856. That's right. That's right. So let's figure out how we get folks in there and not cut corners to do it. Interesting, I want to read you guys a quote, and TJ, I got something for you here. We had talked about that 2011 article from Jeff Proctor, our new uh, executive producer here, and we're glad to have him. Uh, former APD Lieutenant Steve Tate, Director of Training at the Police Department, Police Academy between 2003 and 2006, said, quote, we were clear that we were to get to 1,100 officers, period. So hiring happened that was not in the best interest of the department or the community. Have we learned our lesson from that? I mean, there's, there's, there's a lieutenant confessing that some of the people on the street right. in his own department yeah. are not qualified to be there. Well, we're stuck between a rock and a hard place right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, <laughs> we need more. We need no more cops. Right. Uh, but we don't need sociopaths on the street. Right. <laughs> You know. With a gun. Yeah, with a gun. Right. We're right. That's right. right. And I'm not calling, and don't, and don't give me, don't call me and tell me I'm calling cops sociopaths. I'm not. Right. But I mean, we need good, qualified people. Let me ask you this, yeah. though. The, the, the proposed budget from the mayor calls for beefing up the Albuquerque Community Safety Department we were just talking about yeah. a second ago. Is that the solution here? Are we so hung up on badges that we should be looking at other well, ways to. We, we vote, you know, like what you were saying, mental health is very important. I mean, mm -hmm. that, that's notwithstanding. I mm -hmm. think. Boots on the street, and that's kind of a militarist term, but we, we need cops on the street. Yeah. And I think we need to take, the city needs to take a long, hard look at why we have so few and why the percentages are so, are so down. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, are we being realistic in our goals? I mean, are, are the mayors or who's ever in charge saying, that's okay, right. we, you know, we, a pie in the sky, 1,500 cops, that's, that's right. not going to happen. Get I, I've had people say to me, he called it Marty-itis, that once that original Marty 1200 number was okay, out right. there, mm -hmm. we were on the hook from that point on, and we've never gotten out from under it. And it's right. just, you know. And one more, one more point about this, too. I'm, I'm wondering about recruits, how you recruit people. And are we being honest with the people we're trying to hire? Right. Meaning, okay, we need to define what it is going to mean to be a police officer right. on the streets of Albuquerque. These are, these are the requirements, times have changed. These how, right. is, are how we're going to that's do right. the policing. Tell these people up front, and that's, this has to be done, this has to be done, right. and, and, and show this to them that's right. before, before we hire them or, or in the interview process. Exactly so right. are you still in for this? Be sure to let us know what you think about this topic on our Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram pages. This is Poppin'. Really want to hear from you guys and catch up on any episodes you might have missed on the PBS app on your Roku or Smart TV. Now, we'll be back in just over 10 minutes to talk about the recent action from the Santa Fe District Attorney in the deadly Rust film set shooting case. They want us to be just their marionettes and whoever don't want to go their way, they just kill. That's what they're doing right now. The genocide against Ukrainian nation, it's unbelievable. They just killing merciless everyone. Kids, civilians, women, they don't consider us as an independent nation. They consider us as their slaves, and we are not. We will always prove we, are, we have our identity. Oil and gas brings in tons of money to New Mexico, as you know. And a continued boom in the Permian Basin is certainly reflected in the state budget. But many companies, including those from out of state, are polluting beyond even what regulations allow with few repercussions. Our land senior producer, Laura Pascas, talks with Jerry Redfern, a reporter with Capital in Maine, about the role his reporting played in recent fines levied against two Texas companies. And the two also talk about New Mexico's outsized role in the planet's warming climate. Welcome, Jerry Redfern. Thank you, Laura. Thanks for having me on. So regulators recently fined Matador Resources, an oil company out of Dallas, and Chisholm Energy out of Fort Worth. And the New Mexico Environment Secretary says the fines came out of your reporting. Can you walk me through what was happening and what might change? Yeah, so back in 2019 and 2020, the EPA came into New Mexico and Texas as well and did a series of overflight programs where they had a helicopter with a special camera attached that could see 
gases that come out of um, oil and gas operations, essentially. Um, things that are normally, you can't see with the naked eye. And so they flew around and they found all these different sites from all these different companies that were polluting. And um, kind of, I, I think a number of people knew that this was happening, but there wasn't any you know, particular reporting on it. So I dug around into it a little bit and saw that the EPA had been closing these cases out um, with essentially a slap on the wrist, telling most of these companies essentially, you know, don't do that again. And the company saying, okay, you got us, we won't do that again. Um, which, you know, isn't a particularly effective way to keep companies from doing things. Um, there were a couple of small fines that were involved in that, but really um, they, were, they were going through all this effort to find oil and gas polluters and then not doing anything about it. So I wrote about that. And um, I don't think that New Mexico Environment Department Secretary James Kenney really knew that these companies were essentially being let off by the EPA. He was kind of shocked and I think unhappy about it. Um, Senator Martin Heinrich's office also uh, saw the reporting and got in touch with the EPA and asked them what was going on. And since then, um, starting a couple of weeks ago, the EPA and NMED have started announcing the first couple of what's supposed to be several um, settlements with these companies um, with uh, punishing fines involved in that. So Matador was fined $1.2 million, roughly speaking, and is going to pay millions of dollars more in upgrades to their facilities in the Permian Basin. And Chisholm Energy is has been fined uh, about $440,000, but then also has to do millions of dollars worth of upgrades to their facilities as well. So, and then, and then uh, Secretary Kenny also said that there's many more of these that are coming along. It's just that they're taking a long time to sort of get prosecuted and get them all worked out. Mm -hmm. I think you have some of these videos. Um, maybe you could pop one up on your screen for us while we talk about emissions from these oil wells and facilities. Like what is coming out? We know greenhouse gas emissions contribute to climate change, but what are some of the other things that are coming out of these facilities? Well, you know, it's actually this funky cocktail of stuff that comes out. So. The, the main component is called methane, which is the main component of natural gas. And here I'm showing a video of one of these Matador facilities um, that was that, that caught the EPA's eye initially. And what we're seeing here um, is we're seeing essentially an, an infrared scale of gases that are coming out of a set of tanks. Um, and the, the black clouds that you see are the methane and natural gas and the various other sort of as I call them, fellow traveler chemicals that come along with the natural gas. And they're called volatile organic compounds. And what they tend to do in the air is they're by themselves pretty poisonous, actually. But what they also do is bond with other molecules in the air to create ozone. And ozone is a particularly harmful air pollutant. It's really, really harmful for kids' lungs, you know, growing lungs and also for the elderly and leads to breathing problems um, and health, you know, lung related health effects down the line. So, and this is pouring out of stuff all over in the Permian Basin. Let's talk about the Permian in general. Can you characterize for those of us who maybe haven't been down there recently, what what's happening down there? Well, you know, it's it's kind of funky. It's the Permian's like this really big semi it's arid semi desert area. There's not a lot of people. There's not a lot of trees. There's not a lot of clouds. You know, there's not a lot of hills, but it just sort of rolls a little bit. And when you drive across it, all you're really seeing are these oil wells, uh, gas wells and the um, processing facilities that go along with them every, every mile or so just pop, 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 pop as you drive down the various roads. And then it's also interspersed with this grid of dirt roads that lead all over the place. And down all of those dirt roads, it's the same sort of thing, just pop, 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 oil well, gas well, processing facility. And about the only traffic you see out there in this whole area that used to be ranch land, the only traffic you see out there now are, are big trucks moving oil drilling equipment around, big trucks hauling produced water from these wells around. Um, and then the pickup trucks are the guys who work on these wells um, going from well to well to well to, you know, set them up, take them down, uh, do the monitoring work. So it's turned this, you know, rather large stretch of uh, this, this large corner of New Mexico that takes a long time to drive across. I mean, it's it's not an inconsiderable amount of land, 
and essentially turned it from rangelands into an industrial zone. It's an industrial work zone. So yeah, lots and lots of oil and gas development down there. I've heard the Permian called a climate bomb for the amount of drilling that's going on. And then all of that oil is exported, used here, um, goes out to create more greenhouse gas emissions. Do you have a sense of how New Mexico is contributing to the, the global problem of climate change? Yeah, it's, it's really an outsized contribution considering the size of the population in the state, this the state's population, compared to the amount of development that goes on here. You, you brought up the idea of a climate bomb uh, going off here, and that I think that's a really interesting phrase to use that I know a lot of environmental groups use. I think, you know, it, it's, it's a little bit different than that, I think, in my mind and the way I think about it. Um, and the fact that I sort of stumbled across and should have figured out <laughs> a long time ago is that oil production in New Mexico has gone up tenfold since 2010. I mean, 10 times the amount of oil we're pulling out of the ground now that we did in 2010, and about two and a half times the amount of natural gas. And it has been a pretty steady rise in, in those 13 years. It hasn't been a bomb going off. It's not like it's suddenly zero and goes all the way up to 100. It's been a, a steady, steady, progressive climb upward. And it's continuing to do that as well. Um, and I think the idea of it being a climate bomb is this idea that if we continue to do this drilling in the state, we won't be able to you know, mitigate and cope with the biggest effects of climate change that are coming up down the road. I'm glad you brought that up because recently the United Nations put out yet another report that humans are not on track to limiting warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, which means we are in for, and I'm quoting, climate disasters will become so extreme people cannot adapt. Heat waves, famines, and infectious diseases will claim millions of additional lives, and basic components of the Earth system will be fundamentally irrevocably altered. So we just finished up a legislative session. Um, what did the New Mexico legislature do this year in terms of mitigating, adapting to climate change? Um, well, to put not too fine a point on it, they did just about nothing. Um, all of the uh, notable regulations that would have gone into somewhat further regulating the oil and gas industry in the state, which again is the largest greenhouse gas emitter in the state, um, they all died. And they didn't just die, they died in committee before they really got a chance to get a full airing um, in front of the legislature and really in front of the state. Um, and it was, I have to admit, it was kind of kind of surprising to me. Uh, if for no other reason as well is that none of these laws that were proposed, none of these bills that were proposed, actually were designed to stop oil and gas production. They were just bringing in slightly further regulations to vet better people who could do oil and gas drilling in the state. And it's pretty wide open now to anybody doing that. It opened up the door to um, citizen suits to be brought against oil and gas companies that weren't following state laws because as sort of hinted earlier, the state doesn't really have the resources or isn't, I should say, isn't putting the resources toward doing enforcement of the oil and gas laws that we already have on the books. So that law would have allowed citizen groups to, to take up those sorts of lawsuits. Um, and then there was a reformation of the you know, basic 1935 Oil and Gas Act that much of states um, oil and gas production operates under at this point. Um, that has not been drastically updated in years. And it was looking to add in protections for human life, which you'd think is a pretty decent idea. Um, and then for the natural environment that goes on and tries to live around these oil and gas facilities. Well, disappointing news, um, but thank you so much for your reporting. Um, as the fines against the two companies show, like reporting like this really does matter. So thank you. Thanks for having me on, Laura. It's been great. Welcome back to our line opinion panel. We return to the ongoing Rust film set shooting saga as the criminal case against Alec Baldwin and the movie's armorer is reshuffled with new, with new special prosecutors. Albuquerque attorneys Kerry Morrissey and Jason Lewis are them, and they are taking over the case at the request of First Ju Judicial District Attorney Mary Carmack Altuis. Now, that's after State Representative Andrea Reeves stepped down as special prosecutor 
last month, a few days later, the New York Times published multiple emails from Ms. Reeb in which she talked about the case helping her political career. And Laura, I gotta ask this question. Should the DA have bailed on Ms. Reeb as soon as she saw that email? Because boy, when you read it in the newspaper, the New York Times, it was like, oh my goodness, that did not just happen. She did not ask for a special favor. What was your opinion when you read that email? Well, I mean, it was surprising. I think like a lot of people, you know, and especially, look, I've had the <coughs> opportunity to, to interact with Representative Reeb. Um, she's very professional. She's um, definitely very well, I think, well liked and respected at the legislature. Um, and she's very thoughtful as, as a legislator and very um, good to talk to, very knowledgeable. So I was surprised. Um, and I, I, you know, it sort of made me think about the times that I've said something offhanded over email mm -hmm. um, where you're Seriously. joking or you're saying something and you certainly, you know, I think anybody who knows, especially if you have a relationship with the person you're emailing and you say something offhanded, they know that you're joking or whatever, but if it were taken out of context and, you know, publicized, sure. who it would look bad, sure. right? Yeah. So it kind of made me feel like that is what happened here. I yeah. can't imagine that she actually would have, like, actually would have been saying, let's do this because it would help my political mm -hmm. career. I mean, she, she's done great in sure. her career, sure. regardless of this whole Russ situation. Right. And by the way, it's not an easy thing to do. I mean, being a prosecutor in general is not easy. It's a very, very difficult, very challenging role. Um, and not one that you just sort of do because it's gonna poli be politically advantageous. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I saw it with a little bit of like, I cringed because it was just unfortunate, but I also had to be a little suspicious about sort of the I mean, I think that it was presented in the context of, look, there's some impropriety here, but mm -hmm. I just mm -hmm. can't, I don't believe that that was the intent. That's an interesting point there. And uh, Senator, the, the email reads in part, quote, at some point though, I'd at least like to get out there that I am assisting you as it might help my campaign, LOL, end quote. LOL, I mean, of course, but <laughs> uh, you're an elected official. What would you make of something like that? very poor taste yeah. to start with. It's one of those things that my grandmother would have said was tacky. Right. But, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's stupid also, if you want to, in my opinion, sure. it's very stupid. Mm -hmm. And I don't care how close you are to the person. Don't put it in writing. You can joke mm -hmm. on the telephone, mm -hmm. but do not joke on Facebook or email or any of those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't know her personally. Sure. I was not involved in this year's legislature, so. Uh, but it's a stupid thing to say and do. Now, I'll say also, mm -hmm. I don't think that's really unusual for people to do things in mm -hmm. their lives mm -hmm. to, to get good credit or we name. We are opportunistic people. Right, that's right. or name that's recognition. Right. Yep. And I think that th she saw this as an opportunity right. to do that. Right. Unfortunately, when you when the defendant is um, such a national, international person, right. you have to me you have to even be tighter to the line right. about what you're going to do and say. Uh, if I if she was still in charge and I was a juror, all I would be able to see in my mind is those statements. Right. She's doing this maybe. It would make me take a second look at his culpability. Mm -hmm. So, and mm -hmm. I don't think that's fair mm -hmm. to the family of the people who were killed. Right. So, I, I think that it leads to unintended consequences mm -hmm. more so than just her political future. Good points there. A lot of missteps here. It's not over. I'm not saying that DA is going to lose the case. That's that's not our place here. But there have been missteps here. Are, are you feeling that? Oh yeah. Tell me, I'm, I'm oh, interested. They're, they're lose the case. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. All across the board. Um, Armor maybe not. And, I, I think okay. I think Baldwin will be found innocent. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm not I'm not sure about uh, uh, Gutierrez Reed. Right. Uh, but he will be found. Let, 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 let me back this up though for a second. Let's back this up from a media perspective. Sure. All right. And I I don't know Ms. Reed either. I don't know her. Never met her. You got the whole freaking world watching you. You're, everybody's right. focused on this case, whether we whether we are here here or not. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, 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 this is the New York Times. Right. That's right. You know, um, what's one one of the things we always say to each other? Every mic 
is a hot mic. That's right. Meaning That's right. maybe you don't think every mic's a hot <laughs> mic, but it's a hot mic. That's right. And then if you think you're going to say something like that and you think nobody's going to hear it, somebody's going to hear it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, uh, well, yeah. Well, it no. Down. And, you know, <laughs> God forbid that there's opportunism in politics. Oh, I would have never thought that. Right. That, right. that stuff never <laughs> happens. That's no, right. Baldwin's going to win. Okay. That's uh, Gutierrez Reed, maybe, maybe not so much. But will he take the, the hit and Baldwin go free? That's an interesting question. It's an interesting question. I, my personal opinion, I think they're focusing on the armorer well, yeah. uh, as yeah. more than so, anything else, as right. TJ was saying. But let me ask you a question, okay. though. Sure. Uh, Baldwin's attorney, I'm going to turn to Laura on this one. Mr. Baldwin had no reason to believe there was a live bullet in the gun or anywhere on the movie set. He relied on the professionals with whom he worked, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, finishing, and we will win. People are feeling pretty confident on the, on the, on the Baldwin side of things. And again, we're, it's like a sports event where we can't make predictions here because courtroom stuff is very tricky. Well, TJ. I just, <laughs> or TJ, you're right. <laughs> I don't make predictions, but TJ. Right. But we're talking about you know, fourth degree manslaughter charges right. here. You've got to have something to make that stick. That's going to be an awfully right. tough one. I'm interested in your thought on that. Well, look, <clears throat> I mean, obviously not having followed it as closely on the details other than what's been in the media, which mm -hmm. has been all over the place, mm -hmm. it appears to me that there's also um, reports of, of other members of, of the set who had concerns about the safety right. on set, right? right? That there were, That's right. you know, sort of relaxed standards going on. I mean, the fact that they had this armor who apparently wasn't as experienced, the mm -hmm. one that I, my understanding was there was another one that they had sought after mm -hmm. and was like had decided to decline because mm -hmm. there were concerns about this. So all of that to me, uh, it, it's more it's more than Alec Baldwin, the actor. It's Alec Baldwin, the executive producer. Mm -hmm. Right. And the responsibility that goes with that. So he was the one who was holding the gun. But also, what's the level of responsibility he has overall on the set? That's right. And so I think did he, you know, I think what they're talking about in the defense, and I would expect that they have statements like that. That's what the defense does. Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, they have to be confident like that. It's part of the game, right? Mm -hmm. But what they're narrowing that down to is really him holding the gun as an actor. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah. He had no reason to believe that blah, blah, blah. He relied. Okay. But mm -hmm. he was also the executive producer. That's right. He also should have known about, so, and that's the standard, right? right. For manslaughter, like, right. was, should you have known? Wow. Was there, like, you know, it isn't just you knew and you intended. Huh. That would be first degree murder, I see. right? But negligence standards are should you have known that this was an issue and should you have taken precautions to prevent it? And if there had been other prior complaints, right. then that kind of lends to he should have known. And then I think there's also just a factual issue right. here, from what I understand, which yeah. is that, you know, we, and again, there's been just so much attention on this. But whether the gun itself is capable of firing right. by issue. just holding it, right. right? We have an extra segment online right now where I ask this group about the intersections of faith and culture here in our state as Easter weekend begins. Right now, we're looking back 20 years, almost to the day, when New Mexico's Martha Burke rolled into Augusta, Georgia with a bullhorn, a few dozen friends, and a bone to pick with the leaders of the most exclusive golf club in the United States. Now, Martha Burke knew the male CEOs who were members of the Augusta National didn't pay women equally for the same work as men. So she fired up a protest to raise awareness and she did it all for the world to see during Augusta's world-renowned event, the Masters Tournament. Now this year's Masters is now halfway in the books. So executive producer Jeff Proctor sat down with Martha Burke to reflect on what's changed and what hasn't since her historic protest two decades ago. Martha, uh, it's really good to see you again, and thanks a ton for coming down to talk to me today. My pleasure. Okay. Um, it's Master's Week for those who celebrate, um, and it's also awfully close to the exact 20-year anniversary of you going down and making a big, nap, big mess in front of uh, uh, their little boys club. And we'll get to that in a minute, but... Um, if I recall correctly, this whole thing started with a letter that you wrote. To whom did you address the letter and what did it say? I addressed it to Hootie Johnson, who was head of the club, the Lord and Master, you might say. <laughs> and it was a very polite, short letter. And it just said, uh, we've noticed that you have a very prominent club that attracts the CEOs of America's largest corporations and you don't allow women, and we would like to encourage you to do that. It was a polite letter, probably about four lines long. I can't find a copy of it now. 
I didn't expect really to get an answer, or I thought if I did, they'd say, oh sure, we're stay tuned, we're working on it, something like that. I never expected it to explode as it did. Um, by then, we're talking about 20 years ago, I was already quite the golf tragic, but if I recall my history correctly, you hadn't really thought much about golf or golfers or golf clubs by that point. What was going on for you career-wise at that point, and how did Augusta National get on your radar? Oh, well, I was head of the National Council of Women's Organizations, which had membership ranging from Planned Parenthood to Church Women United, Black Women United for Action, American Nurses. We had about 50 groups representing collectively 10 million women. And our job was to advocate for women's equality. And we did stuff like go to the Hill all the time or harass the President of the United States occasionally uh, to get on certain bills like pay equity, child care, the things that women need in order to achieve equality. And this was just such a minor little thing. I read somewhere in a magazine or a paper, you know, this club and it's a prominent club and they don't allow women. I, so I asked my board, and we were packing up to leave. The meeting was over. And I said, oh, I heard about this golf club, blah, blah. Why don't we write them a letter? And they said, sure, write a letter. No vote, nothing. It, it just wasn't a big deal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I didn't think. <laughs> <laughs> so you weren't expecting much of a reaction at all. Not at all. What happened instead, Martha? Well, my phone rang, and this voice at the other end of the line said, hi, this is Doug Ferguson. I'm a golf writer for the AP. What did you think of... Uh, Augusta National's letter. And I said, what letter? And he read it to me, point of a bayonet, the whole screed. Mm -hmm. uh, and I said, oh, well, I got a FedEx about 10 minutes ago, but I, ha I hadn't had time to open it. I guess it's in there. And from there, as we know, it just exploded into a year long, or a little over a year, actually, uh, argument. <laughs> Tell me, please, about the protest itself. What was the vibe? What was the atmosphere? What was that day? We had a, about a 20-foot pink pig that we had uh, borrowed from Ralph Nader's organization because he always <laughs> said, you know, the corporations are pigs and that stuff. Uh, so we had that down there, and we were hoping to be at the club gates but local law enforcement wouldn't give us a permit. Well, you know whose pocket those boys were in. Shocker. Yeah, <laughs> so they put us about a half mile down the road. It was kind of muddy, uh, just an open field. Uh, the press reported we had 40 people. I think we probably had closer to 60 or maybe even 80, <laughs> but we didn't have as many people as we would have had at the gates. We didn't have any violence, even though, as I said in the, the piece, uh, I did have bodyguards and I did have a bulletproof vest. I had gotten a lot of death threats. Some people take golf much more seriously than they ever should. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? Um, what happened afterwards? What was the private response that you got? I remember the I stand with hoodie t-shirts and the little Ghostbusters buttons with your face in the middle of it. Um, what, what, what was the response privately? How did the public respond to what well, you were doing? Well, most of the women were for us. A few weren't. My husband plays golf and I don't want to play, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, the, shall I say, the progressive community knew exactly what it was about and it was never about golf. It was about equal opportunity to the business deals that were made on that course and in that clubhouse. And I mean, the Fortune 500 was a membership. Uh, you, could, you can't just go put your money down and get a membership to that club. You have to be invited, and they didn't invite anybody but the highest levels of corporate America, or occasionally, I suppose, some uh, prominent preacher or something like that, but there were no normal people, so to speak. And women were trying to uh, get equal footing in the halls of big business, and that's where off-campus deals were made. And so that's what it was about. I want to talk some about the value of protest itself and the value of direct action. 
why did you choose to go the route that you did and to have that day in front of all those cameras and a big pink pig and all of that stuff? And how do you think it impacted what it is you were trying to do? Well, I think it made a difference. They waited eight years to let a woman in so we wouldn't get credit, but we did. I mean, people remembered and, you know, they knew what happened. Uh, but the value of protest is to raise public consciousness. We wouldn't have protested had they not provoked us with this letter they sent that said we won't be held at the point of a bayonet by a women's group of all people. I mean, my God, to let women tell you what to do? No. Uh, but the value of protest is real. Uh, we would not have the civil rights movement, if we didn't, uh, civil rights laws, if we didn't have protests. We wouldn't have what's now very controversial, but uh, the LBGTQ community is under siege, but protest will turn the tide eventually. Uh, you have to get out there, because asking politely to bigots is never going to make social change. I want to flash us forward to today. Um, given the current political climate in this country now, should protest and direct action like that still be on the activist's menu? Yes and no. I think it should be because I think, again, it's vital to democracy. What has changed is the gun culture. And as I said, I had a bulletproof vest way back then, but we didn't have AK-47s on every street corner. And we do now, and so people who protest on either side are uh, under a much larger threat than what we would call a peaceful protest. You know, my grandchild asked me fairly recently what I was doing back in the day. Uh, he said the 60s, 70s. I said, I was protesting the Vietnam War. And we did it, and it was peaceful protest. You know, you never would have carried a gun in the street and, and threatened to kill people. You wanted to change their minds. You didn't want to eliminate them. And that's what's changed, I think. And speaking of change, a lot has changed at Augusta National in the 20 years since you've done this. They have admitted a few women members. Mm -hmm. We're not exactly sure because of their secrecy policies as to how many. They now stage a big uh, women's amateur golf tournament there. Um, and there has been some progress. I was listening to a master's preview podcast this morning and dare I say, they use the word progressive to des describe Augusta, in, in, in the golf space at least, which of course is an incredibly low bar. Um, incredibly low. I, I want to ask beyond that, given that this was never about golf for you, what has changed and what has not in pay equity and the other women's struggles that you've dedicated so much of your life to? Well, this is what's kind of pathetic, Jeff. Uh, let's take pay equity since you mentioned it. Back then, the gap between women and men's pay was so something around 78 cents on the dollar. Women made 78 cents to, and the white man's dollar was the standard. Um, now it's 82 cents. That's four cents in 20 years. So maybe in the next century, uh, at the rate we're going, we need better laws. We need a lot of things to give women an equal playing field. Let's take COVID, for example, just a little digression here. Who lost their jobs during COVID? Women. Why? Because they made less than men in a two-parent family and the lower earner needed to quit to stay home with kids because we don't have childcare in this country, unlike all of Europe and most of the civilized world. So we're making progress, but it is much too slow. Martha, do you have any plans this weekend? What do you think would happen if we went down to Augusta and decided we wanted to go to the golf tournament? Oh, I think the boys would put on a really good show. I bet they would welcome us and say, see, see what we've done? Look at our six women <laughs> out of 300. <laughs> Uh, members, you know that they're they're secretive, but we we're pretty sure it's about six. That's two percent of the membership. Uh, but I think they they would have a different tone, a great patina, you know, and behind that tissue paper equality, uh, they're still doing the same thing. 
Well, maybe next year we'll do that. Thank you so much for coming down and talking to me today. You're most welcome. My pleasure. One year after Russia invaded Ukraine, a group of Ukrainian citizens here in New Mexico is pushing even harder to rally support for their home country. Natalia Pavlenko Edelman and Larissa Castillo lead the organization called Ukrainian Americans of New Mexico. Now, last month, our senior producer Lou DeVizio sat down with both of them to ask about the emotional burdens of the past year and the role women have played in the war effort, both in Ukraine and here in New Mexico. Natalia, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, it's still going on now one year later. What has the past year been like for you? For all Ukrainians, I think in the world, whole world, it's uh, just nightmare for us. We need peace! We need peace! We have relatives, we have friends, we have families in Ukraine. I grew up in Bucha and like almost everybody know what happened in Bucha. And thanks God my brother and his family survived. But 15, my friends or their kids killed. Cities destroyed, like Mariupol. When you look at the pictures, there is a nothing. No trees, no buildings. And before the war, there used to live 500,000 people. Where they right now? Are you I speaking with people in Ukraine right now? Yes. Uh, for example, my brother uh, and his wife, when they tried to uh, disappear f uh, from Bucha uh, because they already like didn't have a sh they bump all the time butcher they couldn't go out because snipers can kill you uh, they to survive they ate some dry spaghetti for three weeks they didn't take a shower because it's no water no heat like a nothing and i remember last time i was talking with my uh, uh my brother I was like a screaming and yelling and crying please try to disappear just try somehow and my brother and his wife took the car. They saw the tanks, tanks go to them close. And their friend's car was the front of my brother's car. And the tank just go over the car. And my brother understood that we, their car would be next. And thanks God, there was a little, like, little you know, like a street and they turned in the last, like, last moment and started to drive in us like fast as they, as they can. And what happened, there was an old street, dead bodies. Lay down just dead bodies. And my brother, uh, actually his wife was driving and she was like screaming and driving through the bodies. And they uh, they survived. Larissa, I understand you have been back recently. What was that experience like for you? I came back to Ukraine in November last year to pick up some of my family members. Driving through dark pitch dark cities because there's no power it was pretty unusual and scary and driving 
on a bus through the bunch of holes on the ground where the bomb fell it was just mind-blowing. And uh, driving through Kiev streets, I saw those anti-tank protective constructions, and I couldn't believe that. I got there safe. I met my family. I was very happy to do that, and just I told my mom, let's hurry up. Let's just get to safety, praying that those bombs are not going to fall on our heads. Do you think that women have played a specific role? They like their freedom, liberty. And right now it's over 50,000 of women are in Ukrainian army. They are snipers, they are military intelligence, medics, paramedics, just frontline fighters. They do anything to make sure that they build the future for their kids. As soon as war broke up, we were trying to see what can we do, how can we help. And we were organizing a lot of uh, fundraisers, a lot of um, uh, food banks, donations. I think we've done uh, more than 10 rallies already. We need to talk to people to explain because everybody tired of the war. It's a, more than one year. It's a, a genocide of Ukra Ukrainian nation. It can be like 80% of Ukrainians can be killed if we will continue to have this war and more countries will involved in this, in this war. This, this person created all the disaster. You're free to do with this person whatever you want. Take a piece. Take a piece, guys. Tear it, rip it, spit on it. Do whatever. That's what this person deserves. It's not just this person, it's Russia. It's all of them. All of them. It's all not only him. him. It's not it. only him. Putin will never stop. He will fight and 76% support in Russia, support war in Ukraine. Now, let us stand for one minute of silence for those who defend our land. What does democracy mean to you? Democracy, that's what we fight for. And on top of our minds, it's being independent. To have freedom of speech, freedom of all the religion rights, all the rights um, we can, we, we demand, and not being dictated. Because Russia comes and tells us what to do, what kind of religion to preach, and uh, how to teach our kids. They want to um, completely eliminate Ukrainian uh, language, and that's their goal, to diminish our culture, our identity, but who we are. They want us to be just their marionettes, and whoever don't want to go their way, they just kill. That's what they're doing right now. The genocide against Ukrainian nation, it's unbelievable. They just killing merciless everyone. Kids, civilians, women, they don't consider us as an independent nation. They consider us as their slaves, and we are not. 
we will always prove we, are, we have our identity. Uh, Ukraine is a young country with thousand years of history. And Russia, this actually stole our history. They stole, stole even our borscht. <laughs> you know, it's, a, it's a, some kind of soup, you know. I remember um, my grandmother had, it's a special blouse like Larissa has, has uh, it's a, called the Vishivanka. And my grandmother put this, uh, this Vishivanka, the blouse, like under, you know, under somewhere to make a, like a secret place. Because if the communists will find this kind of blouses, they can kill you. They can kill you. The Ukrainian poeters. They even didn't let them to write poems in a Ukrainian language. They took them to the prisoner, tortured them, killed them. And I remember when I was a kid, we had uh, not many Ukrainian schools. There are most of them Russian schools. And very, uh, when people ask me here, uh, does Ukraine, it's a part of Russia? Do you have your language? It's really like, yes, we, <laughs> we have own language, we have own culture, and we're not part of Russia. <laughs> we never be part of Russia. What can we do from here to help? Uh, first of all, I want to thank all New Mexicans because we feel their support. We signed a couple flags, Ukrainian flags, and sent to uh, defenders. And they uh, sent us uh, pictures when the defender just like a hug, you know, himself with the flags. They read. Uh, we sign, you know, some wishes for them, protections. We send them pictures. Um, the kids, kids made it, and they just put in uh, their pockets, and they say they believe they will save our lives. Really, they believe in this. Just little things, just it will help. Just do something small. You don't need to have uh, like a big project or make a big fund. Just little things, it will help us. And also it's make our hearts warm because we know we are not alone. Funding for New Mexico and Focus provided by the viewers like you.